welcome to Strange World, where the truth is often stranger than fiction. I'm your host, Mark Sargent, the creator of Flat Earth Clues, which propose that all of us are living inside a Truman Show enclosed structure thousands of miles wide. Check it out at enclosedworld.com or just Google Flat Earth Clues. My wingman for the show normally would be Jonathan from Jersey, but unfortunately, he is currently embedded with a Russian infantry battalion in an undisclosed location, part of Operation Green Helmet? I don't know if that's right. We should confirm that. That's a strange name. Not sure what that's about. Uh, but no, he's, uh, he's, he's out for this week, so we are joined by the grandson of Commander Graham Bethune, Trevor Purvis. Graham Bethune, the most credible UFO witness, I think, of all time, and also known as Space Grandpa. Space Grandpa. <laughs> hey, Trevor, how's it going? Good. How you doing? I think if I uh, keep joining you, I may have to disappear on a mission as well. So we'll see what happens there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, right out there. You're listening to the Ball Earth Skeptic Roundtable, episode number three, on Wednesday, June 24, 2015. If it was a government ops, it's just more evidence that CIA and government sucks, because look what they did. Because now I'm doing videos, so thanks, Mark, if you're a shill. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mark, it as we said before the chat, if you are a shill, you're doing a horrible job. I'm doing horrible. a horrible job if I'm a shill. I, I, please, anyone that wants to call me a shill, tell me how I am hurting this movement <laughs> because it has gotten so much... So, I mean, look at the thousands of videos that have come out, and uh, you know, I'm I am not, and I am not professing myself to be any sort of leader in this. Look, I just put out some videos, thought thought I'd make a couple points. I if if let's put it this way, if I am a shill, then there is no reason for me to go after. Look, shills are pretty much under orders. You do not go after the U.S. government. You do not go after a, a very high-profile military wing known as, known as NASA, which I firmly believe to, to, that, you know, and I'll, I'll say this in the show on Saturday that I'm doing, and that is, look, I'll, go, I'll come out and say it. Look, NASA needs to be shut down. Anybody that's doing subcontractor work for these guys needs to get out of there. If you own stock in a public company that is tied to NASA, get out. Because these guys are, they are, have a shelf life at this point. There's, they're not going to hold up. The, the internet hive mind, social media, and if they end up being the fall guy for this, great. I stated that in one of my videos. Look, they are the first people that are going to have to go down in, in a twisted pile of molten metal. I am going to spend all my efforts trying to dismantle NASA because they're, they're the gatekeepers for me. They're the ones that, if there's going to be a fall guy in this, it's going to be them. And uh, they, they, they've made too many errors over the years, and I'm going to call them out on every one of them. So, so yeah, if I'm a shill, I should not have, be able to say that, and I am saying that. So please stop calling me a shill, and I have to blame Eric. I'm not. I'm not going to pick on you too much, Eric. But you were the one that started this. Well, you know, I'll have to interject there. There are other reasons that people might suggest. I mean, people will say, well, sometimes a shill has to give good information, and they have to accidentally wake people up. But at the same time, they'll muddy the waters. For instance, if they give models that don't work, or if they give models that don't stand up to scrutiny, or if they throw in little things into their model that will turn people off instantly, such as if they start talking about the creators of the dome or if they start talking about the moon, you know, their models for the moon not making sense. I mean, the yeah. idea is if, if, if you're, the, the, some of the objections marker is if the, your model doesn't stand up to proper scrutiny, then even though you're putting in some good info, maybe you're muddying the waters. What do you say to that? Well, and I completely understand. And I've also got probably, I should probably address, it's like, look, I understand I've done a lot of interviews recently. And you also have to understand I solicited none of these people. Every one of them call, called me, and, and they sort of fed off each other. You know, it was like, oh, well, if he's doing it. It was kind of like everyone was daring each other. Oh, I'm going to do an interview about Flat Earth. But once the first few started doing it, it, it became fair game. But as far as what you're talking about with the model standpoint, I tried to remain as neutral and open-minded as possible. Again, not what a shill does. Uh, the, the hubcap model, notice I didn't say roulette table. Uh, the hubcap model is not that much different from the tabletop flat model. 
and you know, not different enough to where if there's something wrong with that model, all of a sudden you have to throw flat Earth out the window. Uh, I, I, th there's no way you're going to be able to do that. The moon, when it, you know, I, where I say, look, there, there's a 3D, you know, a 3D structure, you know, with the moon something being overlaid off the top of it. If the, if the difference between that and a 2D model, which which Eric goes down, again, not much of a difference, which is why. Uh, um, uh, he and I, I, I you know, we we still never had really a debate because we're not debating over that many little, you know, that that many points that that make any difference, regardless of what the model is, what what exactly it looks at like, and that's what well, that's what this thing is is really all about. You, everyone's got to understand, you know, the the skeptics that are out there that something's being hidden from us. The world is not what you think it is. It does not look what you think it is. Now, it may be ridiculous to use the words flat earth. I completely agree, which is, you know, why I went with the enclosed world uh, option. That is, look, if it's artificial, if if we if this whole place was made, you know, designed, then gravity is a mechanical process. And that by that I mean and I I've, I've said this in in multiple interviews, and that is from a design standpoint, it is a form of molecular magnetism, for lack of a better word. And that is, imagine a magnet that can grab anything. Uh, you know, it, it, instead of just metal, it can grab organics, it, you, know, it, you know, clay, uh, wood, sand. It makes no difference. And that is because really, what, what's the difference between the molecular magnetism and what you call density? Uh, you know, is it is it really the same thing? I don't know. Uh, you know, gravity even for mainstream science is is a tri tricky tricky thing. I I like to think it's a mechanical process because then it can be adjusted like anything else. I don't think there's anything left to chance in this system. I think everything is is uh, is controlled uh, at one point or another. If you want to call it divine, if you want to call it you know advanced technology, it's one thing. But uh, I again, if if it turns out to be just flat old density and there's something else behind it, yeah, great. Great, but for me, it's for me, it's mechanical. Okay. Uh, for for me, you know, I try to go, you know, I I try to break it down a little bit more, get more granular in, you know, definition. But again, if people want to go with density, that's fine. Okay. I mean, if if you're using the the roulette table map, I mean, how how does uh, water curve? Oh, I mean, in in, in that water, case, water always seems to be leveling out. Yeah, in that case, you would have you would have to use mine, which is molecular, you know, some sort of molecular magnetism, absolutely, because then you'd have to control the water on all sides. And again, the tabletop flat flat model works better with water. Uh, I'll be the first one to admit that uh, it's it, it's not the one I would use just because you know I I, I like the sunrise and sunsets, uh, how they how they work on the roulette table a little better. You know, I know we people because water flows downhill naturally, and it, you know, and it flows. You want to go with that because, well, we see it in nature. It's like, yeah, but maybe you could artificially control that. Uh, I, I believe it can. So, but but again, if I'm if I am proven wrong in the end, it still does not change the fact that the the ball model, the globe model, is is uh, seems to be an endangered species at this point. Uh, and I know some people are going to go into the curvature, which I didn't. Uh, they're going to go into you know things about gravity, but it's like, look, people can do experiments all they want with with curvature and gravity, and I, I've, I have no problem with that. Unfortunately, for me, they weren't broad enough strokes to to go to the lowest common denom denominator. There's people out there that again, if once you say, oh yeah, by the way, the curvature is eight inches per mile squared, they're just going to glaze over. It, 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 there's some people who are going to get it. Some people, you know, some some smart people, they're going to get that. But so yeah. so at the first at the first mile, it's is it eight inches or it's, is it thirty six inches or I, I can't remember what it was. It, <clears throat> you know, I've heard a, a couple different things. So I don't know exactly. Uh, yeah. Also, people I've heard say you, you don't start till the second mile. So if you're looking at five miles distance, you would actually take that eight times four times four, huh. um, or eight times five times five. But it um, but it starts escalating pretty quickly. Yeah, it's a yeah. parabola, so it's uh, it gets real <laughs> real steep real fast. Got it. the two big ones that I touched on that that even now I, I've got a you know I've got a harp because you you can't debunk it again. That panel didn't touch it. The big one, uh, the first big one is the airline flights in the southern hemisphere, which is the the debunking one that I got started on from that guy from Germany because I looked at it and I was going, no, it can't be, and that is. There's 
the, the plane routes in the southern hemisphere, everything below the equator, so if you're uh, the big ones, if you're flying from South America to Australia, are really up if you're looking at it from a globe standpoint. And that is, oh, hey, Jaredism just finally showed up. Nice to see you, Jared. <laughs> so uh, from a globe standpoint, if you're going from, uh, for people that are hearing this for the first time, if you're going from like Sydney, Australia to Rio or, you know, Buenos Aires, it should be a straight shot about the, across the South Pacific Ocean. And it never is. 95% of, of the flights in the Southern Hemisphere are connections. And they're bad connections. They're freaking out of, way out of it. So instead of these big arcing triangles, they become really, really shallow dog legs. And the chances of that happening, happening statistically are very, very remote. And, but the other part of the the second part of that you know there's second stage part B of that one the that one is that which is why I did clue nine which is how do you hide something like that because people are saying no no there's these non-stops and I cannot tell you how many times they sent me the Auckland New Zealand to Santiago Chile everybody sent me that it, to the point where I had to make clue nine just to shut them up which was, it's like, oh, no, you can get a nonstop. And I go, okay, fine. And then when I started looking, and then I saw the flights being dropped off of GPS in the Southern Hemisphere, then I saw it. Then, I mean, I was already hooked by that point, but then I said, oh, that's so clever. Because you, you all, it, it, what you're doing is you're hiding the routes. Because that's the second part of this, and that is if you can't, if you can't get, if you find a nonstop flight, you don't want to show them how that nonstop flight got from point A to point B, so you hide it. You disappear the flights. It doesn't happen in the Northern Hemisphere. GPS, an American military uh, uh, system called Global Positioning, should not lose flights anywhere, and it does. It, the, there's no coverage below the equator over the water. And you know, when you, when I've looked at the Santiago, uh, the Sydney Australia to Santiago flight, the Qantas flight, uh, you know, the, on on a flight radar 24, it lists lists the the flights that are currently in the air. And the, that specific Qantas flight was not listed, which was a very curious uh, thing for me. Basically, Mark, you're saying that your three reasons for trying to argue for the, the spinning ball not working uh, are yeah. the fly pass, the GPS, and Antarctica. Just focusing on the fly pass there, yeah. if you or if someone that you trusted could take a direct flight from Sydney to Santiago, Chile, and yeah. the flight time fit in with the ball model but not in with the flat earth model which suggests that Santiago and, and Sydney are much further apart. If the yep. flight time fit in based on the plane and the maximum speed of the plane fit yep. in only with the ball and not the flat earth model, would you yep. have to revisit the flat earth model or would you have a way of getting around that? <clears throat> no, no I wouldn't. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Th there's nothing at this point that's going to make me really refute the, the flat earth model and here's why. Which is again why I did clue nine, which is because I get this question just about every week, and that is, look, you may be able to book the flight. And I know some people said, well, they're phantom flights, and you may not be able to do it. And I know that I, there's one of my videos, or um, one of the people that I, I subscribe to, uh, he did a thing called Airline Routes Exposed, where even the nonstop flights, some of those take these weird little stops, these fuel stops. And technically, if you do a fuel stop and nobody gets on or gets off, it still counts as a non-stop. But I, I, I don't even pay attention to that. For me, it still comes down to the routes. And that is, fine, you may be able to get from point A to point B. You may be able to get on a plane in Santiago, Chile, and, and land in Auckland, New Zealand, or Sydney, Australia. But you cannot prove the route. That's, that's my big hang-up. And that is because once you get over the water deliberately, the plane immediately goes into estimated mode or approximated mode. It drops off the screen, and at that point, you have no idea. The, the plane could be going through a freaking wormhole, and you'd never know it because there's no way to prove it. There's no system in place. It, even though it's supposed to be tracking it, it doesn't. Uh, so, I, the, again, people have said, well, you know, we should you know, get a fund. I, I think there's some fund me pages where, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys are one of the ones that are doing it. It's like, look, that you'll get on a plane, you know, from Santiago to, um, to Auckland. It's like, no, don't waste your money because you still, even if you're on that plane, you're not going to be able to prove how it goes there. Yeah, you may be able to take some snapshots out the window, but you're not going to know where you are. You know, an ocean's an ocean. And, sure, but can't uh, we do some basic mathematics? We can look at the maximum speed of the plane. We can look at the flight yeah. times. Then we can just yeah. do some basic elementary mathematics. If you've yeah. flown from 
uh, Sydney to Santiago, Chile, just to take one example, and you've yeah. done it in 11 hours or whatever the time is, if you can just time the amount of time, yes, you don't know exactly what route you've taken, but if it's a 10 or 11 hours, whatever the case may be, then we can do some basic maths and it simply wouldn't work on the on the flat earth map. I mean, it, unless you're it, going to try and say that maybe the plane is traveling well above its its maximum speed or something. No, 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 not not at all. Uh, what I'm saying is is that on a flat earth map, the the route that you would normally take or, or you know, or over that ocean, the South Pacific Ocean which you're supposed to be taking, that part of the map becomes stretched and much much longer. Basically the the map is so wrong that the only way you can make that flight is you have to take a shortcut a huge shortcut across oceans that you're not supposed to, bodies of water you're not supposed to go through, and land that you're not supposed to go through, uh, and that will that accounts for the the uh, the time that you're talking about. But but you see what I mean? If we're on a ball, then I should be able to go sort of underneath the ball to get from Sydney to Santiago. If we're on a flat Earth map, I have to go right around, it, and even if it's a straight straight line. On the flat Earth model, like these southern um, these southern hemisphere hem hemisphere just called hemisphere these southern yep. hemisphere flights, the distance is simply much greater than it would be on a ball. So if we make it in the time that fits the ball, then it doesn't fit the flat Earth map, does it? Well, unless we're going much faster. Unless you're going much faster, or unless the distances are wrong. the The problem is is that even the AE map, we don't know. Because remember, we treat I treat the AE map, and I think Jaronism does too, as a literal thing. But we don't know the actual perspective as far as the distances between segments on the AE map. Because we don't, we're treating it as literal, but nobody knows exactly what it looks like. Which is, by the way, uh, to to digress real quick, um, on uh, Jaronism's laser test that he's going to do, you know, he's doing it from a purely tabletop flat model. Where you know, and that that follows the Eric Dubay model as, as well. Whereas I follow the the flat and stationary Earth model uh, from from 1830 from by Orlando Ferguson. So even then, I, what what I'm trying to get is at is we don't know the exact distances on a flat model because it's never been shown. We don't we don't have an accurate a truly accurate map because we don't know the curvature. We we don't know if there's any curves at all. Uh, so. For me, yeah, there is some speculation there, but no, I'm, I'm still, there's no way I'm backing up. One of the things that you've been criticized for, Mark, on, say, uh, Dubai's forum, not necessarily by Dubai specifically, but just by people, is that you don't focus on these easily provable scientific methods for disproving the ball earth. Are you planning to make a video in the future talking about the lack of curvature? Is that something that you have no interest in making any um, stories about whatsoever? No, no for me... And and I've stated this at a few other things I've done, which is, look, I don't mind. I, I love the fact that Jaron, one of the big reasons I don't do it is because other people are going to do it. Uh, and it wasn't a make it or break it thing for me. The curvature of the Earth, again, because I don't necessarily subscribe to it, the, the tabletop model, the curvature isn't as important to me. Uh, but I, I understand it. I mean, it has to be done. It has to be covered. I'm not going to be covering it. I like the broad strokes. I like the big ones that 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 everyone can get their head around. Again, the curvature is not the curvature argument is not for everybody. It might be for everybody in this forum and maybe people that are listening, but there's a lot of people out there that have no idea what you're talking about when you're talking about the curvature or gravity for that for that example. Although I think the gravity test is still very very good and not necessarily where you're talking about the planes going from east to west or west to east, but the the weight difference, the centrifugal force uh, problem going from the North Pole to the equator, and that is, if the equator is spinning at 1,100 miles an hour and the North Pole it's spinning at zero miles an hour or three or whatever you want to call it, uh, then a weight once you measure something up there at the North Pole and you take it down, you know, assuming it's not a human being where the weight fluctuates, uh, you know, a, a flat weight, and you take it down to the equator, it should be measurably less. You know, maybe maybe even a fraction of an ounce, but it should be less. That I think is a, a a more interesting test. Now, will I get into it? Yeah, maybe. But I've talked about it enough in interviews. I'm hoping that somebody else will will dig into it. Will I will I touch on it personally? Probably not. I, I excellent. Well, I'll tell you what. We're quickly running out of time on tonight's show. So if it's all right with you, Mark, I'll I'll pitch a few questions at you based on some of the criticisms that have come your way. This is natural in the in the work that we're doing. People will be out there trying to debunk you because you're debunking now and what have you. So do you mind if I just ask you a, qu a couple of quick questions to do with you know, your persona in the Flat Earth movement. You know sure. there are some people out there who have criticized you for the pyramids in your avatar on YouTube, for holding balls, like globes, globe earths, when you're doing interviews 
uh, on YouTube and on Skype, and yep. for constantly referring to your model, you know, from a game development point of view, rather than focusing on some of these geophysical aspects like the lack of curvature or like the centrifugal thing you just touched on. These sure. are the kind of criticisms that people make. Do you think there's any validity to those criticisms at all, or do you just uh, fob them off? No. Well, I, I get it. Look, the conspiracy world, and I'm I'm with you there, is a suspicious group. No question. You know, trust no one at face value. I totally understand that. Where and and I I get the argument. It's like, well, no, you're going to make all conspiracy people look crazy. And I'm going, well, you know, you didn't. That 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 aura is already there. Uh, when it came to the, the pyramids, okay, look, I went to Egypt, had a lot of fun, but you got to understand why I went to Egypt in the first place, and that was I was suspicious of the the pyramids themselves. I wanted to see it and 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 look and say, okay, could a mankind have built this? You know, especially ancient cultures. And when I looked at it, I you know that that's what I went there to to prove. So we took some great shots when when I was there, and and no, I didn't put them in because I, I'm a big fan of pyramids. I just you know, I was just there. I thought it was a kind of a cool shot. It has nothing to do with anything. Uh, as far as holding the globe uh, in some of my early videos, that's because I, I it was really more of a prop. And, and uh, I think um, uh, when, when the interviewers actually said before he got me, he's going, don't use the globe anymore. Not because not because he didn't like the, the he thought it was a mixed message or anything, but he says, look, it's played out. He goes, you don't need to use that prop anymore. People have already seen it. But that's what I was really going for. It was just a prop that was, I was saying, look, this is what I was trying to disprove. This is the lie. You know, and it, if I had a flat model, if I had a, I didn't want to use some like hand painted cheesy dinner plate with a with a flat Earth model on it. Otherwise, I would have had that. And I know some people are are thinking of doing uh, 3D modeling. You know, using a 3D printer to do a, uh, a a flat Earth model, and that's great if you can pull that off. Fantastic. And what was the third thing? Uh, pyramids, globes, and well, you, you constantly refer to your model from a, a game developer. Oh, from a um, gaming standpoint, yeah, 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 yeah. That look, I used to produce games for a living. I helped design these things. So, from a game standpoint, from a design standpoint, that is my perspective. That's how I got th these. These clues wouldn't have been made without that sort of background for me. And that was I looked at this thing from a functional. I said, look, if I had to design it, if I had to build this. What would I do? And that's what is really what got me going to where went once I started digging into it, I was going, man, I don't think I could, you know, and of course, you know, there's arrogance for you. I couldn't improve on this design. It's fantastic. It's, it's brilliant on multiple levels. So, yeah, when I refer to it, I'm always looking at it. I mean, I still play games now. After I'm done with you guys, I may actually fire up Warcraft and start playing it a little bit. So I'm not I'm not going to back off from that either. I from a, from a gaming design standpoint, that's where my head is at. Uh, you know, again, I will. But it also it'll it ties a little bit into the curvature stuff. I like I like the the flat and stationary Earth model, the one with this you know it's shaped sort of like a roulette table, because it if it's more elegant from a design standpoint. You know. It's more elegant. Does that mean that it's right? No, not necessarily. If if Eric Dubay's model or Matt Boylan's model, if they if it if it turns out to be tabletop flat, hey, fantastic! I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I will not cry in a corner. A lot of people they've seen your clues. They've then gone on to do their own research. They've discovered the bed for level experiments. They've discovered people like Jonism doing their own um, experiments. So even though your clues don't cover this stuff, you have got lots of people all around the world going and doing their own research. So I think if you are a shill, you're doing a, a terrible job unless uh -oh. this is a long-term game. Now, let me throw something to you, Mark, and then we'll go around the panel to get their opinions. I don't okay. know if you guys are familiar with Dylan Avery, but he's the character who released the first Loose Change back in December 2005. Loose oh, Change was right, being right, right. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. So when I saw Flat Earth Clues, I thought, is this is this guy giving paying homage to September Clues in any way? No, is it a quinky dink? Yeah. I would say no, no, not at all. In fact, I was a loose change guy. Ah, I was. I followed the loose change series. Well, that's um, where you're supposed to go first. It's laid yeah, out. Yeah, and that's and that's all I really knew. You know, okay. for a while there, and so um, that that's really you know it didn't take much convincing for me with the whole nine eleven and it's... and the loose change stuff almost didn't come out. You know, Boeing um, Boeing threatened to sue. The loose change guys on their first. Well, um, I, the first I think that's. I, I I don't have much doubt at this point that that's all controlled opposition. I mean, after all, Vladimir Lenin said the best 
the only way to control the opposition is to lead it. I think that they, there's no doubt that it's part of all major media, military media psyop hoaxes is they manage the opposition. So that was a controlled leak, just yeah. like when they release water from a dam, they don't just blow the dam up and let it flow out. It's released carefully to relieve any kind of tension, pressure, growing opposition. So... So forgive me, but that is why I'm skeptical about just about anything that comes out. So let me pitch something to you guys, and we'll go to you first, Mark. Basically, Dylan Avery released Loose Change, and he was the one that released the film, you know, talking about missiles under the plane and really mudding the waters from the start. But where he really seemed to side for people was that now he says that he doesn't think Bush could plan a bowl of cereal, and he says that the conspiracy world is a dark, dangerous world, the world of conspiracy. It is easy to get sucked in and really hard to get back out. And so there's this notion out there now that Avery was right from the start meant to muddy the waters as best as he could, and then once he'd done once he'd done that job, to then come out and say, no, no, the 9-11 conspiracy stuff, it, it's all crazy. Look at me. I was a leading conspiracy theorist. Now I've changed my mind. So anyone who's still in there, they've just been sucked in like I was, you can see where I'm going with this. So there's, yeah, this, yeah, idea, yeah. there's uh, this idea that whether it's Mark Sargent or Eric Dubai or John Le Bon, or Jaronism, or any of the people, and I don't mean to put myself in your category, but you get what I'm going with here. It could be any of this. There's this idea that someone will get a following, and then all of a sudden flip and say, oh no, this was all just an academic experiment to see how gullible conspiracy theorists are. There's this idea that eventually someone's going to flip and make us all look silly as part of a long-term game. So I want to know, Mark, if you think that this is possible, that this program's already started, and if you it can is, see this happening, and then we'll go through the roundtable and get people's opinions. Okay, it is it is possible, and that question has been posed to me before, although not in quite that way. I like the way you put it. And that is, look, it, it, could it happen? Yes. Remember the smallest club in the world. Uh, you know, of all the conspiracies I wanted to join up on, you know, because I didn't post any, you know, I haven't posted anything on anything, you know, not Apollo, not 9-11, not Pearl Harbor, any, you know, not really much of anything, so... Well, that's you good, because now you're, 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 you're known as the yeah, is, flat, earth, yeah, this, flat Earth guy. Yeah, this is, yeah, exactly. So now, apparently, I'm, I've become the Flat Earth Authority overnight. And I thought but, that Matt guy, and you put him in your video, the Matt NASA comedy oh, guy. Oh, uh, Matt, I, Matt Boylan, yeah. I was pretty sure he was controlled opposition. He was he was acting very irrationally in his videos, which indicated he was just trying he, to he, attach crazy. I thought he was he, attaching he, crazy to, I, I, to the I, I initially was was suspect, too, but I actually I actually spoke with him. And, uh, oh, did you? He called me. Yeah, oh, did you? Because yeah, I reached me. out to him and he ignored me, which I guess is easy to do, but still. I, I think he's trying to build, and rightly so, um, he, he was looking for some sort of catalyst in this movement, because he never really backed away from it, you know? Basically, the story, do you know anything about that, you know, the, his backstory on that one? How the... No, I, I just, I always thought he was controlled opposition, he's just spinning crazy to he, this whole he, idea. His original, his original interview, in my in my opinion, is just brilliant, and 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 it gets a lot of hits, you know, on a lot of mirrors. This is where he's and walking around and on the on the earth. Oh yeah, the... again, he's a performance artist. Okay, and, he, and he's a stand-up comedian, and you know, but he's not two different languages. Plus, well, he's French, <laughs> okay. stuff like that. But it was anyway, it's a great interview. I, I highly recommend it. Well, it's I'm gonna watch it. Because... I got it queued up. It'll be on my next audio uh, that I'm listening to. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought he was a goof, but you telling me that it's not a goof no, is No, no, he's, he's not a goof. Unfor he, uh, unfortunately, he's a, he's a fault against himself in this, in this case because he's got that, he's got that one interview, which, which his girlfriend did, which is, again, I, I consider it just brilliant. But he's got so many other videos where he's doing, you know, he's just going off on just tears, you know, just... <laughs> You know, and, it, and it's tough. It's tough to listen to sometimes because, again, you know, he's he's passionate. But that's the grounding one. You'll understand when you see it. It's uh, that's that's where he gets. You know, that's that's the fan base right there. You know, from from this sector is is just particularly that one video. He's got some others. You know, or I think he's been drinking a little bit. But uh, but yeah. Anyway, that's my take. What? As far as creating the dome, I didn't want to. You can't have it spread out forever when you're when you're trying to explain it to people because people need they want some sort of compartmentalization. You know they want it's like okay you know they want the beginning and the end of the movie. They want you know some sort of space in between that they can get their head around. Yeah. So for me it's like okay we'll start with the dome and if it's bigger than that or if it's weirder than that 
you know, we can go from there. But Does there have really to be just, a dome, though? I don't even know if there has to be a dome. There doesn't have to be a dome, but it makes it easier if it is. What's it you made know, because, of? And who, who, where, where, how, how much do the window cleaners get to clean it? I, I want nice, that contract. nice. And, who, and who's the maintenance crews? And, yeah. And are they, yeah. Are they where, flying around in where's they flying the rope? spaceship? <laughs> where's the rope? No. Your arguments are very clear. They're very <laughs> persuasive. And I, 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 I have to admit, though, I, I did um, have an, I, uh, sort of an unfair advantage there because I used to do um, uh, training, classroom training for proprietary software. Okay. When I was when I was doing stuff for um, time and attendance, I was going to ask. So you must have had all the software slide presentation, syncing of the oh, audio actually, to the that, that stuff. I mean, it, it, you know, I kind of pasted that together, but but the whole concept of um, you know, because for years I would train people on you know basically the basic you know taking complex stuff and breaking it down to where you know it, they could they could really understand it to where we really drive home you know and and it didn't take very long you know they wouldn't you know have these gaps where they'd fall asleep and so when i was doing this it, for whatever reason it just came very very naturally and um you know i was surprised again you know the worst conspiracy of all time <laughs> and you know here i am now you know not only believing it but preaching it so rodney king can't we all just get along right, can we just get yeah. along you know i didn't that's all i said yeah. and uh in that comment I think I was the first one to ever mention your name. And just oh, taking... God. I know, my mistake. But I think taking into everything I knew about that forum and what they were kind of going you know, going for in those conversations, they weren't talking about you specifically, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of she'll talk, she'll behavior this, she'll behavior that. So I just said, I don't care who's a shill. I said, if if Mark Sargent's a shill, so be it. You know, he'll his true colors will show. Well, then they popped in right after and said... Hey, we agree with everything you said, except the part where you said we need to wait and see if Mark shows his true colors. Okay. That he's already shown him. He is a paid NASA shill. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is... This is <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that was weird. As soon as you said that, my shelf almost fell over. Oh, boy. <laughs>